Have you ever heard a line that has changed your mind? The first NLP line that really it just absolutely changed my mind and revolutionized the way I thought about something, felt about something, and orient my, oriented myself towards something was when I heard the line that the meaning of my communication is the response I get. Because I really didn't know that or believe that or understood that. I thought that the meaning of my communication was what I meant and said. And if someone didn't get the meaning of my communication, I'd just say it again, louder, harder, faster. <laughs> Slower, <laughs> louder, <laughs> louder especially, louder. <laughs> because I thought the meaning of my communication was my intention rather than the response I got. So when I heard that the meaning of my communication, the response I get, and that's the meaning to them, regardless of my intent or style or practice, it, it shifted me from a, a kind of a blame communication frame and guideline because if the meaning of my communication is my intent and what I said, then, then I'm wondering what's wrong with anybody who doesn't get that. But when I realize that the meaning is the response I get, because that must have been the meaning that they created and, and generated from my words and, and behaviors, then I went into the non-blame frame approach and just the curiosity, what did you hear? That's not what, let me try it again taking full, complete responsibility for what I say and do in that communication process, that the meaning. So, so that line changed my mind, changed a lot of the communication training I was doing at the time, and set me on the pathway for NLP. In just a little bit, I'm going to give you a chance to maybe share some of the lines that have changed your minds, but that's the subject of what we're, Bob and I are going to do today as we look at mind lines. This is the master practitioner training and a lot of the things that we're going to review briefly you've already covered and we're just going to review it just for the f process of setting those frames but this is going to be pulling together a lot of the patterns a lot of the processes the meta model the Milton model uh, a lot of the trance work we're going to be pulling it together so that just conversationally we can say a few words and invite someone in the movie theater of their mind to represent things in a different way that can change their lives because that is the power conversationally of words. So that's where we're going to go with everything, uh, the lines that can change minds. M brains feed on lines, feed on words, feed on statements, feed on paragraphs, stories, metaphors. Our brains feed on lines that contain instructions about how to represent things. And that's the nice thing about a line that, that reframes a way of looking at something. And so we're going to, to look at the structure of meaning. We're going to play around with sending the brain in seven different directions and having numerous patterns in each one of these directions. And um, we're going to play around with a magic box, a magic cube, and how to think about uh, reframing. And through reframing, um, we'll be able to just conversationally do anything and everything in NLP and neural semantics. So this is really a good summary model. Are you ready? Ready, Last ready for those lines. Are you ready to have fun? We're all lined up. Well, we don't have fun, let's leave. <laughs> <laughs> this will be fun. Dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> On page 128, I've pulled from uh, Using Your Brain for a Change uh, by Richard Bandler a lot of the classic lines that, that now are part of the history of NLP and some of the presuppositions. So I'm going to read some of this if you want to read along with me or if you just want to listen to it and notice what it does to you. But this is Richard Bandler at his best, and these are lines that change minds. The problem with brains is they, they learn things too quickly and too well. Human beings have this amazing ability to learn. The bad side, you can learn a lot of garbage just as easy as you can learn a lot of useful things. It's an amazing thing to be able to remember to get terrified every time you see a spider. You never find a phobic looking at a spider and saying, oh, damn, I forgot to be afraid. <laughs> Are there a few things that you'd like to learn that thoroughly? When you think about it, having a phobia is tremendous learning achievement. Phobics are people who can learn something utterly ridiculous very quickly. 
Most people tend to look at a phobia as a problem rather than achievement. They never stop to think. If, if she can learn to do that, she can be able to learn to do anything. These are lines and frames and presuppositions. Um, when you do it the first time, you stumble around a bit. Later, when you get more familiar with what you're doing, you get streamlined and systematic with whatever you're learning. People work perfectly well. I may not like what they do, or they may not like what they do, but they're able to do it again and again systematically. They're not broken. They're just doing something very different from we, what we or they want to happen. People aren't broken. Another difficulty with most psychology is that it studies broken people to find out how to fix them. That's like studying cars in a junkyard, trying to figure out how to make cars better. If you study a lot of schizophrenics, you may learn how to do schizophrenia really well, but you probably won't uh, learn about things that they can't do. So there's a reframe and a set of lines about psychology. Always keep in mind that anything anybody has done is an achievement, no matter how futile or painful it may be. People aren't broken. They work perfectly. The important question is, how do they work now so that we can help them to work, work perfectly in a way that's more pleasant and useful? Here's some lines about depression. There are times when you don't get what you want from someone else. When you don't want, get what you want, feeling bad is extra. Feeling bad, it might take a moment for that one line to, feeling bad is extra. I mean, that's the second problem. The first problem is you didn't get what you want. <laughs> feeling bad is extra. <laughs> it's a bonus. <laughs> Did you ever think of that? First, you don't get what you want, and then you have to feel bad for a long time because you didn't get it. In speaking to a man who claimed he had been depressed for 16 years, he said, that's amazing. You haven't slept that long? <laughs> of course, the structure of what the man says is, I've coded my experience in such a way that I'm living in the delusion that I've been in the same state of consciousness for 16 years. I know he hasn't been depressed for 16 years. He's got to take time out for lunch, for getting annoyed, and a few other things. People spend a lot of time and money learning to mediate, um, meditate, in order to stay in the same state for an hour or two. <laughs> if you were depressed for straight, an hour straight, he wouldn't be able to notice it because the feeling would habituate and it would become imperceptible. <laughs> line after line after line. That can change your mind. Uh, <laughs> um, Psychologists are always looking for the deep, hidden, inner meaning. They have to, they've taken too many poetry and literature classes. Change is a lot easier than that if you know what you're doing. <laughs> Might put that on your office wall. <laughs> and he's talking about Sigmund Freud and all those Greek myths. <laughs> um, confusion is always an indication that you're on your way to understanding. Confusion presupposes you have a lot of data, you just haven't organized it in a way that allows you to understand it yet. Years ago, I realized I'd been wrong so many times, I decided to just go ahead and be wrong in ways that are more interesting. <laughs> that's a good one. So those of us who are gloriously fallible, that's our theme, to be wrong in ways that are more interesting. Um, if you understood everything I said and never got confused, that'd be a sure sign that you're learning nothing of significance and wasting the money that you paid for for coming here. So if you do training, there's a good line. Uh, the healthiest thing you can do is to become confused, and while many people complain about how confusing I am, they don't yet realize that confusion is the doorway to new understanding. Confusion is an opportunity to rearrange experience and organize it in a different way than you normally would. That allows you to learn something new and see and hear the world in a new way. So when you get confused, get excited about the new learnings that awaits you, and you can be grateful for this opportunity. Go somewhere new, even though you don't know where it will take you. Um, on wanting everything to come easy. Of course, none of us wants that, you know, the <laughs> path of least resistance. But what if you grew up and everything was wonderful all the time? You'd grow up to be a wimp, totally unable to cope. Kind of the ego strength that we talked about yesterday. Uh, many r therapists have a rule about against being effective. They think that influencing anyone directly is manipulative and manipulation is bad. It's as if they said, you're paying me to influence you, but I'm not going to do it because it's not the right thing to do. <laughs> when I get clients, I always charge them by the change rather than the hour. I only got paid when I got results. So there's a new frames on that one. 
A lot of people think NLP sounds like mind control as if that was something bad. I said, well, yes, of course. If you don't begin to control and use your own brain, then you, then you just have to leave it to chance. Mind control. The greatest error of all is in thinking that the only way you can feel good in certain circumstances is for someone else to behave in a certain way. You must behave the way I want you to so I can feel good. Or I'm going to feel bad and stand around and make you feel bad too. <laughs> One thing that always amazed, amazed me is that people are seldom strange, nasty to strangers. You really have to know and love someone before you can treat them like dirt and make them feel bad about small things. Few people will yell at a stranger about important things like crumbs on the breakfast table, it, but if you love her, it's okay. <laughs> so some of these lines just is a description of the way some people live, but when you put them in words and create a line. Most people have read the, the following one. It's one of my favorite ones. I think uh, one of the favorite ones uh, that really shows the power of mind lines. A father dragged his daughter into a counseling office with her arm twisted behind her back, and he shoved her into a chair. And Richard said, is there anything wrong? He said, this, my, this girl is a little whore. Well, I don't need a whore. Why'd you bring her to, here to me for? <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, who is this girl? My daughter. You made your daughter into a whore? <laughs> No, no, you don't understand. You brought her here to me? How disgusting. <laughs> you brought her here with her arm twisted behind her back and threw her around. That's how prostitutes are, are, are treated. And that's what you're training her to do. Well, I, I want to force her to, oh, force. Teach men, uh, teach, teach her that men can control women by throwing them around, ordering them around, twisting their arm behind their back, forcing them to do things against their will. That's what pimps do. The only thing left for you to do is to charge money for it. <laughs> Let me ask you, look at her. Don't you think, uh, don't you want her to be able to feel love and to enjoy sexual behavior? But uh, how would you feel if the only way she learned to interact with men was the way you brought her in that door a few moments ago and she waited until she was 25 and married someone who beat her up, threw her around, abused her, and forced her to do things against her will? But, but she may make a mistake and it may hurt her. Well, that's possible. Two years from now, that guy may drop her like a hot rock and go away, and when she feels lonely and bad and lonely, she'll have no one to go to because she'll hate your guts. Isn't it more important for her that she learn how to have loving relationships, or should she uh, learn to have the morals of any man who can force her around? That's what pimps do. So pretty powerful in terms of lines that can change a mind. So, lines that change minds. We have many, many of them in NLP. The NLP presuppositions are all lines that can change minds. I mean, wh what a powerful line behind every behavior, some positive intent. What a line. And how it reorients us in life. What a line. The map is not the territory. Because most people, I don't know, I would guess that most people in the world move through the world thinking that what they think and believe is real. And think that it's the territory. Because they believe it and they feel it. And the map is not the territory, but just a map about the territory. And we need maps to be able to navigate the territories we go into and, and move around. So lines that change minds. So lines that have changed your minds. Because one of the ways to really appreciate the power of these lines that we're going to be exploring and creating and developing is to identify some of the lines that have changed our minds. There's no failure on the feet that changed minds. That's a lot of other beliefs I had. And <clears throat> when I really muscled it, it gave me a sense of freedom I've never had before. Gave me permission to forgive myself. What a thought. No failure. Gave me permission to make a mistake without beating hell out of myself. Gave me permission not to be perfect. <laughs> what about you? Anybody got one? Let's uh, get the microphone ready. If you've got a line that has changed your mind, it might be something from this model, it might be something from somewhere else. Because a lot of times it's great to hear some of the lines that have changed your minds. This isn't a problem, it's an opportunity. Okay, this is not a problem, it's an opportunity. <clears throat> so once again, how we frame it, and that's the first level of framing, just what do we call it? It's from my father. Kevin, you don't understand. You're the son, I'm the daddy. You don't, he said, I, I don't do what you say, you do what I say. My father told me that. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and that changed your mind as a child. <laughs> Other lines, just some really nice graphic lines that have changed your minds. Something that is like you were moving through life and then one day you heard something or, or you invented something. And it was a line that just created a whole new orientation. Feelings and emotions are two different things. Feelings and emotions are two different things. Okay. For so someone who couldn't feel. Okay. Yeah, we make that distinction that feelings are kinesthetics in the body and emotions are our value judgments of those. Michael, one you brought to us in South Africa last year and I taught and learned with numerous people uh, when things go wrong in, uh, in relationships or whatever, it's more about them than about me. Okay. So oftentimes the things that happen in, in the world, it's really about what's out there and it's not about me. So the, um, so the, so that line, okay. That's an interesting belief. That's when an I interesting said belief. About myself, that were not really good things to say. That's an interesting belief. Okay, this allows us to now to to frame it as just a belief, an interesting one, and to re recognize that map territory distinction. It's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> Some lines will work for some people. <laughs> when you're, oh, the context is when you're whining. <laughs> All right, some people really enjoy whining. <laughs> <laughs> Two really affected me when I, I found NLP. One was the map is not the territory. Huge shift yep. on that one. And the other is the meaning of your communication is response you get. Okay. I started using a number of years ago that I'm more than my emotions. I'm more than my thoughts. I'm more than my speech and behavior. I'm more than, than those expressions of me. And, and for me, that was a, a nice uh, line that changed my mind. I don't care. You can't make me. <laughs> okay. I believe Kevin has regressed. <laughs> <laughs> shifted me and it was um, we're not human beings seeking a spiritual experience but we're spiritual beings in a human experience okay I Excellent. like that yeah. good one as you think about some book titles uh, and, and I, don't, I don't know if that's a book title but I've seen that many places uh, Albert Ellis wrote a book a few years ago how to stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable about anything dash I mean anything and what a line how to stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable about anything, I mean anything, what a line, if, if that became the line that was going to feed my mind. Uh, in relation to coaching, yeah. in relation to coaching, um, it seems to me that uh, everything reminds me of a story, and I always could come up with a story, and a, a good friend said, John, it's not about you, it's about them. Uh -huh. Shifted my whole approach to uh, to it's to not people. about you, it's about them in terms of coaching. Be true of therapy, teaching, parenting, managing, leading. It's not about you, it's about them. Well, let me think. Uh, you're talking about book titles. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, what was that one? Uh, uh, what, what is the name of this book and that whole series? Uh, th this book has no title. That, that one, uh, Smullyan, uh, changed my life. A long time ago, <laughs> that one in. So watch out for, <laughs> watch out for what in the world? How in the world did that ever change your life? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this book has no title. Yeah. So, what did that mean to you? <laughs> well, well, see, it, it, it was a puzzle. You were supposed to guess what the title of the book was by reading it. If your book has no title, then you're in the void, and you can title your book any way you want to title it. Okay. Even on the other side of this card. You <laughs> uh, a couple of them. One is uh, whenever uh, dealing with somebody who's got a lot of complaints, uh, that's a heck of a wine list. Shall we pick a rosé or chardonnay? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> and another and, one and is. And you don't get slapped too often. <laughs> duck. <laughs> Cold duck. Um, 
And the other one is a man is just about as happy as he makes up his yeah. mind to be. Yeah. I think that might apply to women too. Women are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. I think the one was the bandler, it's never too late to have a happy childhood, yeah. which we've proved by buying toys and having fun. <laughs> and, uh, Every time you go into Toys R Us, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Our computers are us. <laughs> and, then, uh, and the second one is, is between stimul stimulus and response lies a choice, okay. which we can choose our response. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Between stimulus and response lies choice. Uh, I have a, you are not a father, you do fathering. Okay. That one uh, in, uh, totally, absolutely changed the way I see my daughter. I just said your thing. I bet he's got a picture of that three-year-old beautiful daughter right in front of him. All the time. Okay, excellent. A, a book that changed my life many years ago was Man the Manipulator. A little background. A year before, I had four Sunday schools with three with weakness only to get into them. And one lady said to me, the way you ask something, there's no way I can give you a no. Okay, so what is the line that changed your mind? Just a book. I could see myself as manipulating everybody. Oh, excuse me. I could see my mind manipulating just about everybody very well. Okay, okay. <laughs> Less devaluing people. Okay. So... So as we think about lines that change minds, we're looking for those really powerful, impactful ones, those lines that, that we're going to be focusing on positive lines, lines that, the lines that really orient us in a way that brings out our best. So, so genius lines, mastery lines, lines that allow us to be more well-adjusted to our mind, our emotions, our, our experience, to other people, those kinds of lines. And so as we do that, one of the first things we want to start doing is to identify problems, complaints, uh, cr criticisms, whether they're internal critic of our own mind or the criticism that others offer us, uh, thoughts that give us problems, ideas that give us pro ideas and lines that, that trouble us. And so we want to make a collection of some of those, and in a little bit we'll uh, let you get into a group. But let's throw out a few lines that we need to address and reframe. Because once we start playing with this model, you can do it on the cuff. That is, you can do it just as you're talking and conversationally when someone offers you something, and then how to come back with a line that, uh, and we'll pace it, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get rapport with the person, and, and then offer other, other lines that will set new and wonderful frames to offer a new vista of life. And of course, we can do that with ourselves, and we can do that with other people. So what would be some of the lines that you would like, complaints, arguments, excuses, criticisms, that you would like us to, to maybe deal with in our groups the next two days? So let's get the microphone over to Alan. Oh. How about uh, releasing your brakes? And what does that mean? Tell me. I, I don't, I'm not following. Well, it implies that we have, a, we have plenty of gas and plenty of momentum, but for some reason we're holding ourselves back. So, so what is the complaint or brakes. what is the criticism we need to address? Oh, some kind of a hang-up, maybe a, a, a dragon. Okay. Some kind. And that's what we're looking for, real specific things like that, like NLP is manipulative. Right. That would be a dragon line, an excuse, something that that somebody may offer us that we want to reframe in a new and different way. So do you have a specific one? That's what we're looking for. Being short-tempered with people, that sort of thing. So, so what, how would someone express that to you? Being short-tempered, yeah. Somebody else express it to me? If they have a, a short temper, you mean? Oh, well, they might be abrupt or uh, raise their voice or okay. snap at them. Okay, so what, what do you think about that? Well, I don't like it. Because? You know, it's, it's, it, it seems to violate my map. Okay. That I deserve more respect than that. So, so when people are abrupt with me, uh, they're being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So there's a line. So some of the lines we may answer to our own selves. We may reframe for ourselves rather than conversationally to them. It's conversational back to ourselves. So that may be a line that we may want to play with here in a little bit. When people are abrupt, when people raise their voice, they're being disrespectful. Okay. So other lines? I don't have enough time. Okay. I don't have 
enough time. It won't work for me. Would you like would you like to have twenty six ways responding to that? <laughs> <coughs> wait, 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 wait. When people uh, are abrupt, uh, they are disrespecting me. Okay. You're using that NLP stuff on me again. You're using that NLP stuff on me again. I wonder if he has a picture of his wife in his mind now. I can guarantee you, sir, psychology is just a lot of bunk. Psychology is just a lot of bunk. Okay, that that comes I close to that, that comes close to some of these. Um, it won't work for me. Psychology won't work. It's a lot of bunk. So, so sometimes there's going to be repetition along those lines. What have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? <laughs> you hear you hear this a lot. But I think it's a lot of context. Okay. Um. I don't know you. Um, I don't trust you, and you have to be cautious. Okay. Cautious. You have to be cautious. Okay. I can't do it. I can't do it. And, and let's name some specific thing because it will help us uh, in the groups when we do that. I can't do what? I can't, I can't learn that pattern. I can't. Okay. I can't run that pattern. Um, I can't apply NLP to myself. Um, I can't learn this stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you next week. Ed said the check is in the mail. Okay. Um, let's get the microphone when you. If I had enough capital, I could grow my business. Okay, so there's going to be some complaints and arguments. I don't have enough money. If I had more capital, then I could succeed or grow my company or something. So um, I'll just put it generically. I can't succeed without more money, something along that line. And I hear a lot, if it wasn't for my mother or father or parents, I wouldn't be this way. Okay, if it weren't for... I wouldn't be that way, or wouldn't be this way, okay. I don't have enough time to do X, Y, Z. Okay. Did we, didn't we have that before? Is that up there? I don't have enough time. Sorry about that. And so, so some, those are a lot of times uh, the reframes that we need to do for ourselves. I don't have enough time. Or someone else will say, I don't have time to do this or that with you with regard to something. So I've that complaint. That. I've heard that before. So get, look, give me a little bit more specifics around that so we can play with that. I've heard that before, and it obviously doesn't work. Therefore, I don't want to hear what you have to say now. Okay, so this is a, a, a discounting and excuse. Um, I've heard th this kind of stuff before. Um, therefore, therefore, I, I know I know exactly where it's going to go. Okay, I I have heard this stuff before as a complaint or excuse. Um. So many of us work in some sort of a health care industry, coaching for health, health concerns, speech problems, that how to reframe that X is permanent, like okay. stuttering, cancer, uh, these kinds of things, okay. that they're permanent or they're terminal, how to reframe. 
Okay, once so you once have, you have X, once you have X, it's permanent. You'll always. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of things that would fall Personal. in that category. Uh, I can't afford it, referring to people who don't want to afford the coaching and so on. Okay. I can't afford coaching. So we don't have en I don't have enough time, but I don't have enough money. Is a very similar thing. I don't have enough money, can't afford it. Well, the structure of the complaint is the same. I don't have enough time, money, something. Kind of same here. I can't succeed without more money. I can't afford it. So most of those excuses will fall in that kind of a category. So if you play with that one, then you can massage that in different ways. One I've heard is, uh, why does this keep happening to me? Why does this keep happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> Why does this keep happening to me? So here's the problem about some reoccurrent pattern that just goes on and on. If I'm not like, uh, uh, how can I say? It? If I'm not, if I'm not like somebody else, I just won't succeed. Okay. For example, if I try to compare myself to a leader in in a, in, a, in a business or in a in a certain area, I, I just say, but I'm not like that person, so I won't succeed. Okay, I'm not like so and so, I will not succeed. I need to be more and more like this or that person, expert model before I could. I cannot do it in my own uniqueness. A general statement about causative, so and so makes me such and such, the whole victim thing. We had okay, so any statement, um, he makes me angry, uh, frustrated, upset. Uh, any any emotion for there? He makes me. She makes me. It makes me. They make me. Uh, my company makes me. Uh, the government makes me. So anything that has that kind of a structure. So we've got a lot of things to play with, and in our groups a little bit later, we will do this. Bob and I are going to type this out so that we'll have it clearly there, and we'll pick out some of these and start reframing them. And two days from now, you'll have 26 ways to reframe whichever ones we pick, and we'll play with them, and then we'll do some kind of a presentation along that line. The, uh, the reframing models is, um, is on page 132, the template for mind lines in action, and it, it fits with the diagram uh, that we have on, on the overhead. And when we look at this, um, uh, this is a template for looking at, at something and, a, and taking a toxic thought, and these would be some of these toxic beliefs, ideas, thoughts, and, and we're going to play around with it. And just to give a sense of, of it, and to play around with something I think very significant um, that may be going on right now, the statement, these mind, I can't learn these mind lines because, because they involve too much complexity about the structure of language patterns. I can't learn, so here's an impossibility statement. I, I can't learn these mind lines. I can't learn these mind lines efficiently, effectively, so that I can use them and have them at ready availability because, so here's a cause effect, because they involve too much complexity about the structure. So what we'll start exploring and, and identifying a little bit later is this formula, the magic uh, formula. Too much complexity leads to or equals I can't learn. So just to give you an idea of where we're going to go, this is an overview. So those of you with the meta program of global, this will give you an overview of where we're going to go and 26 ways to reframe it. I'm going to read out of the, the updated version so it may or may not fit exactly the text in your, your, your text there. But we'll go through these 26 patterns to give you a, chan a chance to see. Some of these mind lines, some of these lines will be very effective for you. Some will not do much for you. And that's the nature of them that every mind line will not have the same kind of impact or, or profound uh, uh, ch change of frame for you, but some will. We start with the specifying the magic and the magic strategy in order to pull apart the, the process a little bit. Complex, you say. How do you know when to judge something as too complex? How do you represent complex in your mind? How do you know it is com complexity and not just one simple, idea upon another simple idea. How does the complexity stop you from learning altogether? Detailing the strategy, how, how is it that you go into this state? What leads you to first become aware of something as a complex subject? If you first see or say something s s 
to yourself, what do you do then? And what comes after that? And how do you cue yourself that this complexity is going to stop you from learning? So when we get the information from those questions, then we can start reframing. How interesting. What I find really complex and difficult to learn are the chaotic word salads that a schizophrenic produces. Trying to understand the order and the structure and that. Now, I would call that difficult. Reframing the internal state is the problem may seem like that you can't learn these language patterns, but don't you think that the real problem is how much effort you feel that you'll have to expend in really learning them? You can learn them, but the learning may not come as quickly and as easily as you would like it to. Anyway, how do you know to label a subject as complex and not just the next step in learning? What, reflexively, what? I don't understand you. Why do you make such a, a difficult and complex uh, complaint to me about learning these mind lines? I just can't figure out what you really mean by these complicated complaints. Apply to self. Wow, that seems like a pretty complex analysis of your learning strategy. Where did you learn to think and reason in such a complex way? Or counterexample. So do you mean to tell me that you've never learned anything that once upon a time might have seemed complex to you? Somehow the, the existence of complexity itself prevents you from learning. The prior positive intentional frame. I wonder if you see learning in terms of complexity in order to not feel overwhelmed by something. I'm sure it protects you from taking on too much or for, from feeling dumb. Could it also be that this belief about complexity protects you from failing to learn something new and exciting? And the prior positive cause. When you describe your experiences in the fourth grade that the teacher who pushed you so hard, it, it impresses me that that perhaps was the initial experience that you made from which you made this map about complexity. Being pushed too hard and too fast without proper training would make a subject seem complex and overwhelming. The first outcome framing. So if you use this belief and let it run your life, next year you will uh, make no further progress in learning these language patterns. How does that settle in terms of your communication and persuasion skills? Do you like that? As you imagine not learning anything about these mind lines next year and remaining unskilled in them again the following year, what will result from that but more lack of progress? And after that, what will result when you get that outcome? And then the eternity framing. When you imagine yourself stepping into eternity as you leave this world and you think about having avoided learning and especially learning anything that would improve your communication skills, how much do you think that you will have missed out on life, relationships, and effectiveness by letting this idea of complexity govern your life? Then some of the outframings as we go to model the world. How interesting to posit this idea that learning is dependent upon complexity or simplicity. How do you know? How do you know? Um, do you know where you got that map? From what experience did you map that difficult and layer, layer subjects? And in some mysterious way, ha has the power to prevent you from learning. How does it strike you now as you realize that this is just a map and doesn't seem like a very enhancing one at that? How important is it to, for you to avoid complexity in comparison to taking the time and the trouble to learn something that challenges your mind? How important is this avoidance uh, related to developing your highest skills? And then to the allness framing. Since everybody has encountered complex information at some time, does this mean that they should, ca cannot or should not attempt to learn that, those kinds of complex things? Would you recommend this to other people? What would happen if everybody on this planet adopted this belief about complexity and learning? Then the have to framing. Do you have to see things in this way? What would it feel like if you did not use this belief about complexity to think about new, learning new and challenging things? Identity framing. Is this who you are? Someone who will not challenge yourself to take on something that's more involved? Are you not a thinker and learner who can think about things in a step-by-step -step manner, adding one piece of knowledge to another until you master a subject? Is that who you want to be? And then under other abstractions, A team, what if you discovered that learning complexity actually involves the same mental processes as learning the foundational processes of any field? What if you discovered that you're labeling a subject as having complexity itself creates the problem? And then ecology, how well does this belief serve you that you can't learn complex things? Does it enhance your life? Does it increase your motivation and drive for learning? Does it increase your resilience? Would you recommend this belief to others? 
And then as a story or as a metaphor, when I first saw a Hebrew text of the Bible, I thought, this is really complex language. I don't know if I'll ever learn this. Then I began to think about children born to people who speak Hebrew and how they just grow up with that language and they learn it with as much ease and effectiveness as children in any other language environments learn those languages. Thinking about that makes me realize my error in the conclusion of the so-called difficulty of Hebrew. I didn't realize that Hebrew isn't complex as much as just different from what I've already knew. So I began at the beginning. I first learned the shape and names of the Hebrew letters. I learned a little bit here and a little more there. And eventually I gained a level of competency so I could read a page. Yet what previously had seemed so complex now seems natural and easy, a piece of cake. And then, um, do I have the other ones in there? I don't have the other ones in there, thought I did. We don't have them manually. So this begins at least 20 of the reframes around one subject of complexity and learning and the relationship between those two ideas. And that's where we're going to go, just to go at it in, in seven different directions as we frame and reframe and outframe and deframe and preframe and postframe and, and counterframe and then do analogous framing. So we'll have seven directions that we'll go in a little bit. But before we get into all of that, the question becomes what state do you need to be in to do that? What state do you need to be in to do that? Focus? Curiosity, playful, permission for applying, flexible, not a flexible. The worst state is the serious state. Because if you get serious with this, the strain, the pressure, the forcing will, will, will undermine uh, learning and creativity. So one of the things we'd like to do is to suggest that we go into a magical state so that you get out your magic wand and, and you get out your magic hat <laughs> so that you can feel like you're ready to do some magic because that's what we're going to do with this. We're, <laughs> we're going to do some that. Where's my cape? Uh, I didn't bring my cape. Uh, I'll bring my bandana, my magic bandana. <laughs> So we want to get in groups, and you've accessed many, many states, but have you ever accessed? <laughs> <laughs> Watch the end of that one. <laughs> Red hot poker. <laughs> and you can feel this <laughs> in just the right place, <laughs> in just the right way. <laughs> have you ever uh, accessed a state of feeling magical? That's what we want to do. It's, it's a new and a wonderful place to send your mind and body. So think about a time and a place where you felt a little magical. Or if you didn't feel it, think about a magician. Think about someone who was doing something wild and wonderful and playful. And, and we want you a little bit mischievous. We want a little smirk when you come back. Because if you get a little smirk, then, you're, then you know that this is just language, it's just words, it's just grammar, it's just syntax. And we can play with it. We can, we can mold it. We can move it. We can, we can start having that flexibility to move backwards and forwards and ups and down. So the most important thing is being in the right state. Because if you're in the wrong state when you're learning this, it can hurt. <laughs> we, I mean, really. I don't, I don't remember if anybody here was with me in New York City when we did this training. We had uh, 40 or 50 people. Um, Keith came up to, to record it. And, uh, and we, had a, we had a psychologist, it hurt her so much, she's trying to put her brain around this thing. And, and it was a real great example of, of, if you get serious, you will get stupid. I mean, this woman had a PhD, and, and she was in so much pain by the end of the first morning. Um, you know, we had to take her out to, to, you know, do some patterns on her to, you know, calm this thing down because we didn't set enough frames. Because she was, she was tormented that, I'm not getting it, I'm not getting it. And I don't know what she was meditating herself with, <laughs> but I would not recommend it to any human being. And she finally had to leave. <laughs> so when you come back, be playful, be mischievous, be magical, be, be, in a, be in a great state for working with this language. They will not work if, number one, you don't get on the problem. We'll talk more about that. And number two, you do not deliver them correctly. Your state and delivering them is absolutely crucial in getting shifts and not getting resistance. That's how come Michael's doing this. Very important. 
congruency. It's, it's so important. It, this won't work. And so at the end of the mine lines, we will be talking about how to deliver them. First of all, we're going to be how to create them, how to think out of the box. And so permission to think out of the box is to think about magic and, and pretend and as if and possibilities. And, and the realization that, that ma meaning is very plastic and has a plasticity that we can start molding and making. Because this is not a problem, it's an opportunity. Because, uh, and, and so as we give new and wonderful meanings to things, but you need to be in a playful state. So find that if you've never been playful, magical uh, as a child or as an adult, and some of you are that way the other day, <laughs> um, then, then model someone who, who can be that way or pretend that you are. So we'll give you 10 minutes, five minutes each in partners to get in the most magical state that you can get. And so return here with a mischievous look in your eye and a little smirk on your lips and be ready to do mind lines. So five minutes each. We do uh, mind lines to a, a new group of people who don't know NLP or master practitioner level of NLP or neural semantics. Uh, this, is, uh, this is brand new stuff and we have to spend a lot of time on it, but, but the structure of magic or the structure of meaning and how we create meaning is summarized in this little formula here, that the external behavior it leads to and is equal to some internal state. And by this point, you may even have forgotten, well, how is that magical? But the magic is that there is this connection that we are creating that only exists really in our minds. So what does rudeness, what does a loud voice, what does abruptness, what does someone cutting us short, what does that mean? Well, it, it, it could mean anything. It just depends upon what state do you go into? Do you go into that mischievous, playful state? or into that feeling assaulted and violated state? What state do you go into, that internal state that you go into in response to that? So on page 149, th this is the stimulus response structure. And it's magical because you create it. And it's your own internal magic. And, and that's why Richard and John, in the structure of magic, said magic uh, is in the language we speak. The webs that we tie and untie are at our command, if only we know what we have, language, and the incantations of growth. So magic exists in the language we speak because it's tying things together and, and weaving a web, an incantation, of either growth or limitation, impoverishment or enhancement. And it's, it's created by that little formula there that is so deceptive because on the outside, it seems like this external behavior does lead to this internal state. And of course, if it occurs again and again and again, then we just assume that's the way it is. This leads to that. After it leads to that over and over, then it equals that. This gives us the two meta-model distinctions, cause effect and complex equivalence. And so at the linguistic level distinction, uh, this little line here, is the line of cause effect. That's the cause effect line. And this little line here is a complex equivalence line that equals or means. And if this is about this is who I am, then we have identification. So everything that we're going to do, everything we're going to do is built around these three linguistic distinctions. And, and so cause effect, complex equivalence, and I identification. And on page 149 at the very bottom, stuff gets connected neurologically. So what does fire mean? I don't know. What does fire mean when external behavior fire, something outside? What, what state do you go into? Well, it depends on your history. If, you, if your first thought of fire is a candle and a romantic dinner, maybe fire means romanticism. If fire, first thing you think is a fireplace warming up in the winter when you've been skiing or sitting around a campfire and roasting marshmallows, then that's what state you go into. Or if your fire house burned down when you were a kid and you had to live out in a motel for a while, out on the street for a while, maybe that's what fire means. If you were in, in uh, uh, eastern Colorado a few weeks ago and your house was burned down by the forest fires, maybe that's what fire means. So fire gets connected to 
And through habituation or through intensity, then it gets linked and stuff gets linked. And on the inside, that's the magic. It can be black magic, it can be white magic. Okay. What, what I mentioned earlier, the importance, uh, number one, of getting on the problem, getting onto the map. That is <clears throat> their problem being activated when you deliver your reframe. If they are not running the problem, if you're not on their map, chances are your reframe will not work. What Michael is talking about is right here is where we work. We change how this connects to this. How an external event, external behavior equates to an internal state. And by changing this connection, we will change the internal state. To get that done, we need to get the problem in the format of a cause-effect, complex equivalent, or identification statement. Write this down. Cause-effect, question, how is that a problem? To get it into the format of a cause-effect, how is that a problem? I only ask that question if they are, if you know they're having a problem. It's a generated problem. <clears throat> Complex equivalent question, what does that mean to you? That's the one question that I ask more than any other question doing therapy is what does that mean to you? If you ask the question, how is that a problem? And if the, it's not a problem, they'll tell you, well, it's not a problem. So make sure, since your acuity, that they're having a problem. How is that a problem? We'll get it in the form of a cause effect. We'll be working more on really chunking that down and getting it right. We'll be spending a lot of time because setup is crucial, number one. Delivery, number two. The other one, if it's, a, if you, if it's an identity issue, you want to get it in the form of an identity. You know, what does that say about you as a person? Or if you can say, fill in the blank. This means this about me. You know, or I am. You want the I am statement, but you want to. You, if you're challenging identity, you've got to get it, the identity, what, what it means to them as the identity, what the problem or challenge equates as per identity. So cause effect complex equivalent identification. We have to get it in that format. Those questions will assist you in getting it there, and it's very easy, and very quick in many cases. But with more to come about that as we progress. So when someone says something to you, the pacing statement is, is that a problem? Or short version, so? <laughs> yeah. And then a person will tell you more of the magic that is driving their mind their emotions. And they may say, well, she makes me feel this. Or I can't I, I, uh, state, I can't do this because of something. And so we start exploring it. This looks like a straightforward formula, but probably a better th graphic for your mind is something like this. Here's external behavior. That's one thing. That exists at one logical level of our mind. And it's different from, it's in a different dimension from internal state. Internal state is not external behavior. It's internal state. So we've got these graphics that you can put in your mind. So, so here is external, here's internal, and this is a good example that these are not the same. So that's why this is, to some extent, inadequate. Because these are at different logical levels. One is out in the territory and the stimulus that comes to us, and the other is internal. And so one is the world of events, the external behaviors, and it's not the same thing as internal state. So that's why we went to the cube and went to putting the, the leading to and the equal sign there so that this is different. And the so map the is cube. not the territory. So outside, inside, outside, map, inside. The territory. And so if this is outside, then we could give it this internal state, or, or we could give it another internal state, or another one. We can just keep on going around, because this could mean and lead to many other things. And that's the magic, that's the plasticity of it. And so if you get that in your mind, because the way to hear anybody talking is to listen for two things. Are they talking about something out there in sensory uh, language, sense, uh, sensory awareness language? And if you don't hear that, if you just hear them talking about how they feel, I just feel insulted, I feel violated, I feel put down, or uh, this makes me, or I can't, then you're hearing internal state. But if you can see it on the screen of your mind, then it's external. Well, and then you can ask, well, what does that mean? You can ask, what does that lead to? 
You can ask, so? <laughs> and now we're getting the formula. So thinking in terms of this formula gives us the ability to start working with the lang magic of language and, and the webs that someone has tied. Someone says something about whatever, what they do, what, they, how they f uh, what someone else does to them, what they're encountering, or what they have experienced in the past, and, you s and then you want to know, well, what does that lead to? What does that mean to you? And so external behavior, internal state, is, is right at the very, very heart of this whole model of how we link things together and how we create that magic. So st first thing to know about magic is that meaning is a head trip. It's an internal thing. It doesn't exist out there. Does everybody feel that in your body? To know that meaning, is out, it, meaning does not exist out there. It's, it's really, I created, I'm the meaning maker. It's an internal state. Because this is really crucial. And we <coughs> choose what meaning we give it. As do other people. So the mind line pattern is about giving them other options to consider as to what meaning to put to the external behavior and or the internal state. That's what these mind lines do. It takes them all over the place. Uh, you talk about switching perceptual positions. We're fixing to switch a few perceptual positions. That's what mind lines do. Holding in our mind that this person may not know it, but they are at choice as to what kind of meaning they can put to that and we're going to invite them to consider other meanings, other possibilities. So before, uh, one of the lines that, that uh, somebody really changed their mind was that between stimulus and response is that gap of choice. And, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to send it in another way to give it another internal state. We're going to give it other meanings. We're going to deframe it. That, that in between, stimulus response is choice.